Hey, everybody. Welcome to your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. I'm your host, Jean Chatsky. Thanks so long. Thanks so much for coming along today. We've got a great conversation teed up for all of you on the heels of Super Tuesday. The question we're asking today is, is what do Americans want from their next president. And according to a new report out from the Pew Research Center, 73% of Americans say that strengthening the economy is their top policy priority this year. On the heels of entering the peak 65 zone, older Americans 65 and up are even more specific. 77% say making sure that the social security system is financially sound is critical. 61% would like to see work done on reducing health care costs. And now that, again, Super Tuesday is in the rearview mirror and the 2024 presidential election starts kicking into high gear, we are looking toward what looks to be a rematch between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. As Election Day draws closer, what factors really will determine who comes out on top? And what would a Biden or a Trump presidency mean for the economy and more specifically for all of those Americans for whom retirement is looming? Here to answer all of those questions and more is my guest today, Mark Zandi. He is chief economist for Moody's Analytics. Mark is a trusted advisor to policymakers and a top source of economic analysis for businesses, for journalists, including me, for many, many years, as well as a resource trusted by the public. He regularly testifies before Congress on economic issues. You've likely seen him perhaps earlier today on CNBC, NPR, Meet the Press, CNN, and other national news programs. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Gene, it's so good to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks again. And for anybody who is watching, whether you are joining us on LinkedIn or Facebook or some other platform, if you've got a question that you'd like to pose to Mark, if you've got a comment that you'd like me to weave into this conversation, don't be shy. Just post it in the comment section and we'll be happy to uh, we'll be happy to bring it into our stream of thought. All right, Mark. So here we go. I mean, Super Tuesday yesterday looking like it's it is another matchup another vision of yesterday between president biden and former president trump what what does this look like when we think about it through an economic lens how is this election going to impact the economy as we go forward and when you think about the candidates um how do you frame the impact that either one of them can be expected to have well, Gene, the, I think the election's a big deal. Uh, first point, though, is obviously it's not just about the president, it's about the Congress and the makeup of the Congress. I mean, if one party controls the presidency and the Senate and the House, then a lot more will get done, obviously, than if uh, there's a split Congress. Uh, and right now it feels like it's going to be more likely than not a split Congress, regardless of who wins the presidency. So that'll you know, make it more difficult for anyone who's in power, whichever president, whoever wins the presidency to uh, make big changes. Uh, they'll, they'll make some changes for sure, but uh, that'll that'll slow things down and make it a little bit more difficult. So that's that's important to consider. The other thing I'd say is it, it really does matter. Uh, and you should really listen to what the candidates have to say. The one thing I learned uh, listening to former President Trump back in 2016 is when he was saying things about tariffs and border walls and uh, immigration, uh, uh, deporting immigrants here in the country, you know, all the kinds of things that he was talking about. He actually did them. Uh, he was also talking about tax cuts and he did the tax cuts. Remember that? The Trump tax yep. cuts. In Absolutely. You know, he didn't get exactly what he said he was going to do during the campaign, but, you know, that was the campaign. You know, there's a fair amount of hyperbole, but directionally he did what he said he was going to do. So, I'd listen, you know, very carefully to, you know, what the candidates are saying. And they have, I think, different visions for the future. Uh, I think uh, if you listen to President Trump on the campaign trail now, he's, the message is kind of roughly the same. Uh, you know, he's, he's talking about tariffs this time across the board. Uh, he's talking about 10% tariffs. 
60% on China, obviously a heavy hand on immigrate, immigrants, particularly uh, immigrants already in the country. And he's talking about deporta- deporting uh, immigrants. Of course, his tax cuts uh, that he passed back in 2017 for individuals, high income households and individuals who got those tax cuts under current law, <clears throat> there's no change in law. They will expire at the end of 2025. So he'll, he'll, he'll sure, certainly be working to change that and codify those the tax cuts. And he's also talked about further reducing taxes, particularly for corporations, businesses, cutting the corporate tax rate down even further from what he did previously. Uh, and, and that's on economic, that's kind of on fiscal policy, tax spending policy. You know, big differences in terms of regulatory policy, how to regulate the banking system, how to re- regulate the energy sector. Of course, President Biden is much more focused on, uh, you know, he passed the Inflation Reduction Act, so he's really worried about and focused on climate risk and making the investments to help with the transition over to a green, a green economy. And you know, that'll go in different directions depending on who wins. If if uh, Biden wins, then that gets codified going forward. If President Trump wins, then that's going to be rolled back, I, I suspect, by a significant degree. Uh, I don't think President Biden would impose tariffs. Uh, you know, he's I think uh, we'll continue to be play tough with you know or with China in particular, but I I, don't, I doubt there'll be more tariffs. And I think even though he's it feels like he's getting more uh, uh, restrictive on immigration across the border, I doubt he would uh, engage in a widespread plan to deport immigrants that are already in the country. I mean, and there's so many moving parts here. We can go on and on and on. But the bottom line point is, pay attention uh, because you know what these uh, candidates are saying pretty good chance that's what they're going to do or at least try to do when they become president. You, you mentioned the, the 2017 tax cuts, the, the Trump tax cuts. If we have a second Biden presidency, there has been some talk that some of those could uh, could be continued. As you sort of read the tea leaves, do you think that we're looking at a scenario where um, where they all fall off or where we'll see some sort of movement there? I think, uh, again, listening to what uh, President Biden has said, he's really focused on people who make $400,000 a year or, or, uh, or less. For those folks, I, I think they'll, he'll be sure that the tax rates don't rise on that group. Anyone above the 400 k kind of threshold, I suspect you know, tax rates are going back up. Uh, you know, to what degree? They might not go all the way back to where they were. The corporate tax rate may not go all the way back. The, you know, Pre-Trump, it was, I think the Top marginal rate was 35. Now it's 20. Maybe they split the difference and go to 26, 27, something like that. So they'll roll back some of it, but not all of it. But if you make less than 400K, I feel pretty confident that uh, you can feel uh, assured that uh, your tax rate won't, won't go up. Um, you've been very prolific in print lately. We're going to talk about some of the things that you've written. And one of them was you, you wrote a piece about four different scenarios that could flip this election um, in one way or the other. Can can you take us through, if not all of them, then the most important? Yeah. So this goes to my election model. Thanks for bringing up that up. Of course. Dean. So if you folks are interested, because I'm not going to go into the gory details, but if you're a nerd uh, like Gene or me and you want to read to Zandi presidential election model. And uh, the model is at the electoral college level, at the state level. It, it predicts the percent of the vote that goes to the incumbent party, in this case, the Democrats, uh, by state. There, and it's explained by a bunch of political variables and a bunch of economic variables. So political variables are everything from previous voting patterns. So for example, if you, you know, if Wyoming always votes Republican, Rhode Island always votes Democrat, we take account of that. Third party candidacies matter. Turnout really matters a lot. Now, obviously that goes back to how excited people are about their candidate. Uh, believe it or not, Gene, approval rating doesn't really matter all that much. I wouldn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. It's not really significant. Uh, favorite son, I can go on and on, but on the economic side, it's real household income, real meaning after inflation, because obviously inflation has really been, for good reason, really an irritant for people. And uh, it's really the key reason why economists think the economy is doing well and many people don't because of the high inflation that we previously experienced. And we could talk about that. But we account for that. So it's inflation relative to people's incomes and wages, so real wages. Here's the other two key variables. Uh, the cost of a gallon of regular unleaded that really matters a lot because people use that as a kind of a litmus test for how they 
think about inflation and their, their broader finances. And mortgage rates matter also because I, I think, you know, you have a uh, housing affordability has com- been completely hammered by the high mortgage rates and high house prices. And uh, a lot of people in their 20s, 30s, even early 40s who want to get into owning a home are finding it all but impossible. And so that's really matters to them. So that's another thing to watch. And then uh, con- uh, se- sentiment, consumer confidence, all those things matter. So those are those are all the key variables. But I, I would just highlight gasoline prices. Mm-hmm. If you know gas goes up, and we can talk about how much and how that would affect things. Mortgage rates, uh, and then on the political side, I'd really focus on turnout and third-party candidacies. That that could matter a lot, uh, depending on who who the candidate candidate or candidates are. What when you're focused in on gas prices? Because I've noticed them creeping up a little bit as I've as I've filled up my car. How how high do they have to go for them to be a real factor in the election? Well, actually, not that much higher. I mean, uh, I, I'm, nationwide, they vary quite a bit depending on where you are in the country because of the state taxes on gasoline. Three buck forty, three buck fifty for a gallon of regular unleaded. That's up from, as you said, maybe we got as low as three buck twenty, maybe three buck ten nationwide. Not too long ago, uh, some of it's seasonal. It's just seasonal, uh, you know, the seasonality and the and the, and the you know, blends that need to be produced for environmental reasons in different parts of the country. If it gets much above four dollars a gallon uh, for any length of time, not for a week or two, maybe not even for a month, but if it's two, three months of above four, all else being equal, everything else I just said equal, no change, uh, the election will swing. And I, I didn't get the bottom line. I didn't, I didn't tell you who's and the winner is. But if, if you use my Zandy's forecast for the economy at the state level and look out to election day and uh, put in all the information you need to run the model, Biden will win the election. It'll be very close. There'll be five states where it's within one percentage point. Uh, remember, we're trying to explain the share of the vote that goes to the incumbent. So one percentage point. And in, in, in given that as a backdrop, if I raise ga- all else being equal, gasoline prices to $4 and keep it there for, for a quarter, three months, the, the election flips and Trump wow. will win. You know, Trump will win. Uh, one other quick factoid, because uh, you see you got me going here. Five states are within one point. Let's see if I can remember. PA, my state, Pennsylvania. Uh, North Carolina, really important, must win for President Trump. Uh, Georgia, uh, Nevada, and Arizona. Those are the key swing states. And it turns out that Pennsylvania is the swingiest of swing states. <laughs> live electoral vote. You and I are both going to have to vote. Yeah, that's right. Because you're from Philadelphia. You live in Philadelphia. Yeah. Right. That's right. So we that's count. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Never um, counts, Gene. I, I, I certainly, I certainly won't miss it. I, I'm, I'm always afraid that I'm going to be on the road unexpectedly. So I, I made sure oh. to uh, send in the paperwork to get there that mail-in go. ballot. So I, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss it. When, when we talk about housing and we talk about mortgage rates, we're really talking about interest rates. And um, you were uh, on CNBC earlier today and, and are of the view that it's time for the Federal Reserve to start thinking about lowering interest rates sooner rather than later. Why, why is that? Why do you feel like the time is now? Not think about it. Do it. Let's start. Let's get going. Let's lower interest rates because they've achieved their objectives. They have two objectives by law, uh, their so-called mandate. One is full employment. The other is inflation that's low and stable. On full employment, the unemployment rate is 3.7% nationwide. It's been there for two years. I'd say that's full employment. That's about as low as the unemployment rate ever gets. Uh, and it's across all demographic groups, not just you know one group. It's every single group is experiencing very low unemployment. So check full employment. Inflation that's low and stable, I'd say we're you know there. I mean, they have a 2% target on the, what they call the core ex-food and energy consumer expenditure deflator. But, you know, uh, we're at, uh, th- that's the target's 2%. You know, uh, abstracting from the vagaries of the data, I think we're at 25 and headed south here in a very clear way. The only gap between the 25 and the 2, the reason why we're not at target is the, going back to housing, the growth and the cost of housing services which is tied back to rents, market rents. And we know rents are flat to down and that's gonna continue going forward because there's just a lot of multifamily supply coming to market, particularly at the high end of the rental market. And so, I, you know, I, Gene, I forecast many things, some things I'm confident in, thing, some things not so much. 
this one I'm confident in. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're going back to Target in the, in the next few months by the end of the year. So, you know, why, you know, why take the risk with the economy? And by the way, the, the, the funds rate, federal fund rate target, that's the interest rate the Fed controls, is it is high. It's five and a half percent. And uh, even by their own, the Fed's estimates, the interest rate that's consistent with monetary policy, neither restraining the economy or supporting the economy is half that, maybe even less than that. So, I, you know, I just keep coming back to why take the chance? Why take the risk? Now, I'm maybe splitting hairs. I, I saw Jay Powell today. He was testifying in Congress. He's the chair of the Fed. And he seemed to be talking a what economists call a more dovish tone, meaning the bar for him to actually start cutting rates may not be as high as I thought it was. So I feel right now, Gene, a little bit better than I did at the start of the day. It feels like they're getting pretty close to cutting rates, but they should go. Uh, they, there's no reason to wait here. I, I think there are a lot of people who would be very, very happy to, to see them follow suit on that for for a lot of reasons. I, I want to take a turn here and talk about um, retirement security. We are now at the uh, start of what the Alliance for Lifetime Income has has named the peak 65 zone. This is this is the greatest surge of retirement age Americans in the country's history. We've got 11,200 people turning 65 years old every single day, more than 4 million a year. And research shows us, you can look at any number of studies, that the majority have just not saved enough for retirement, um, leading to what a number of experts have called a retirement crisis. In, in your mind, as you think about people retiring, are, are you are you concerned? Are you uh, are you not at all worried? Are you somewhere in the middle? I'm worried. I mean, a lot of you know, obviously, uh, at, the, at the base of people's income support in retirement is the Social Security system, and the Social Security trust fund is running out of funds and will. Uh, I haven't looked most recently, but within the decade, uh, will run out of funds, and then Congress has got to make. A decision, you know, what are they going to do? Are they going to continue to fund Social Security benefits as, as that has been promised to Social Security recipients? Now, my sense is that they will do so by if they don't do that, despite the trust fund being out of money, they'll come up with the cash through the general fund. But if they don't do that, uh, I think they're toast, right? Because people are going to be so mad, rightfully so. You, you know, they made investment, they made uh, savings decisions, investment decisions, retirement right. decisions based on the certainty that the federal government was going to come through with those benefits. So I think they'll do it. But nonetheless, you know, wackier things have happened. And uh, we need to, you know, I think, uh, nail that down. So, you know, I do think whoever the next president is and whoever the next whoever controls the next Congress, soon after they uh, get back into office in late January of 2025, they got to sit down. They got a bunch of things they got to do, by the way. They got to raise the debt limit again. And they got to figure out what to do with those tax uh, Trump tax cuts. Uh, there's some Obama tax care, uh, health care subsidies, I think, that come due. Uh, but they really need to think about it in the context, broader context about Social Security. And then ultimately, obviously, the other key program for for um, for the elderly is Medicare. Right. That's really critical for, you know, uh, shouldering sure. the burden of health care costs. So that's the number one thing you got to We got to nail that down. And, yeah, I am worried. And then, of course, as you point out, many Americans have not saved enough. Uh, you, you know, and their their lifestyle saving up in the sense that they're not going to be able to finance the lifestyle in retirement that they had uh, before when they were working before retirement, and that's that's an uncomfortable place to be. That's not a great place to be. So I do worry about that, and uh, you know what that might mean. So uh, you know we do we do need to address that. Hopefully we can get uh, you know people saving more here, and I think they are. I, I, one really positive development you know recently has been the run up in uh, asset values. I mean, mm -hmm. look at the stock market, right? I mean, that, only 60% of Americans own stock and probably uh, you know, a third own a fair amount of stock, but the stock prices are up and that's very helpful. And here's the other thing, housing values. This is good, really very important as well. Two thirds of Americans own their own home, which is great because they likely have a lot more equity in that home uh, built up over the last several years. Here's a here's an st amazing statistic, Gene. The uh, the median house price in the nation has risen by 50%, 50% 
since the pandemic hit four years ago. That's the national average, 50 50 percent. Wow, That's pretty That's amazing. Crazy. Right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and great news for a lot of people. Yeah, so that should be very helpful. But none, regardless, I mean, we've got to be vigilant, and people have to really start thinking about, and and really think about, you know, their uh, financial situation in retirement, and think about what kinds of changes they can make to make sure that that's uh, on sounder ground as that as, as that retirement approaches. And as you point out, I'm headed to that 65 year mark per here pretty quickly as well. <laughs> Not not as quickly as I am. I I, I suspect um, the when we look at retirement and when we look at shoring up your lifestyle in retirement, economists are often fans of income solutions of of annuities that will allow you to maintain. A, a paycheck for as long as you live. And, and these could be a traditional pension. Social security is an annuity. Um, there are other solutions that are, uh, that are being rolled out by, by different firms that are, that are working on these sorts of solutions. But when you look at people in retirement and their behavior, their spending behavior in retirement, can you talk a little bit about having a, an income versus a base of assets and how that impacts the behavior of people who are living through generations where they're not working? Yeah. I mean, this, uh, I think you're, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, kind of guaranteed income as opposed to you know putting your savings into a, a, a stock or a bond or whatever it may be. And that return is highly variable and you're not sure exactly how much income that's going to generate and what the, the change in the value of that asset is going to be over time. Uh, and if uh, 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 retirees are more engaged with uh, uh, financial vehicles, annuities that you know provide a steady s source of income going forward, regardless of how long you live, then I think that uh, makes it a lot easier to obviously plan, manage your affairs, and uh, uh, make sure that you can lead the lifestyle that you want to, you know, in retirement. Um, so uh, you know, m my sense is that's a really a uh, you got to be careful, right? Because you're relying on the financial health of the company that's providing that guaranteed income. So you're going to make really sure that you are, you know, look at the ratings of the institution, make sure that they're on rock solid ground because, you know, you could be in retirement for 30 years. You, this company's got to be around for 30 years paying your, your off your, uh, your investment, just like uh, the other uh, folks that are, you know, made the same decision you have. So you have to be, you have to be careful and cautious but I think that's a very good way to go in terms of, uh, you know, just assuring, ensuring that you have a steady stream of income, you know, long in the future. And it makes it, you know, obviously uh, reduces the kind of the angst and the pressure. You're not looking at CNBC every afternoon and see if there's green on the screen or red on the screen, which I think for most people that would be that would be well, very well uh, welcomed. It is. It is these days when you turn on CNBC in the afternoon, or when you go to CNBC.com and you you look, you're you're often seeing green instead of red, and that makes us feel good. Maybe it makes us feel overly optimistic. Yeah. Right. As, as you are forecasting for the future, as you're looking at the stock market returns that we have become uh, accustomed to over, uh, but the last couple of years. What's your advice for people as they plan for the future, as they look at how much they have to save, how much they can anticipate that their savings will grow and how to, how to not get ahead of their skis? Yeah, I think a, a prudent planner would plan on uh, stock uh, portfolios appreciating maybe four or 5% per annum going forward on average, you know, some years it's going to be higher. Some years it can be lower. It can be even, you know, years when recession, you're going to see actual declines. But if you, you know, cut through that volatility, you should, if you maybe take one step back for, for a lot of people, you should, you know, as you grow older, you may not want to be in the stock market at all or any to any significant degree because you have to have a long-term horizon here, you, uh, not next year, not the year after, but over, you know, a 10 year period. But if you're okay with that, uh, given your, your circumstances and your risk tolerance, 
then I would plan on four or 5% per annum, which is actually a lot lower than what we've gotten, you know, in recent history over the last few decades. Uh, and that goes to the fact that, uh, you know, valuations are high. I mean, if you look at how much, uh, uh, if you look at stock prices relative to the underlying earnings of the companies, which is the basis for the value of that stock, they're, they're, they're uh, quite high. And the other thing is corporate profitability is very, very high. If you look at margins for businesses, it's, it's as high as it's ever been in the data we have going back to World War II. So you can say, you think to yourself, well, can it go higher? Maybe, but, you know, prudent planners would say probably not. You know, it's what economists call mean reverting. It's going to come back to what we've experienced historically. So that means, you know, slower growth in profits going forward. And that's, again, the, the, the basis for the value of a stock. So, again, I, I wouldn't count on 10 percent per annum returns like we've gotten over the last 10, 20, 30 years. I'd count on something closer to four to five percent. Um, my husband talks an awful lot about reversion to the mean, but he talks about it in terms of his fantasy baseball team. So um, <laughs> yeah. that's that, that's where I hear that uh, that expression most often. Um, let's come back to housing for a second, because I think that's another important piece of um, not just the economic puzzle for people, but the, the retirement puzzle for people. If so much of our wealth and our assets overall are tied up in our homes. What is the best way to think about that as you look toward life in retirement? Um, should you be thinking about staying? Should you be looking at thinking about selling and downsizing? Should you be, do you think about this as an asset or um, that can be drawn on for future support, or is that a, a mistake? Well, I think most people do use their home, the equity in their home, as a source of uh, retirement income. I think you know uh, you're lucky you know, if you don't need to you know tap that equity at some point. Uh, and there's different ways of doing. It. I think you you lay them out nicely. One is you can uh, move. You could sell your home and downsize by home. Uh, the lesser value and pull out that equity and use that, you know, to finance, uh, you know, your, your retirement. You can borrow against your home. So home equity lines of credit, closed end second loans. Obviously, there's an interest rate attached to that. Uh, so that enters fees. So, you know, you have to consider that. But that's another way people do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the third way is uh, the reverse mortgage, which is less popular, uh, but you know, you know, there's, uh, I, uh, I think that might gain some traction here going forward because people do have a lot of equity built up in their homes and that might be a viable way, uh, a cost effective way to pull uh, equity out o over time. That's backed by the FHA and, you know, the FHA has been doing some yeoman's work recently trying to shore up uh, that, that mortgage product and making sure that that's, you know, going to be viable going forward. So that, that would be a potential third option. And then you get, you know, you just have to sit down and think about, uh, you know, all the variables that go into making that decision. Do, am I happy with the home I'm in, you know, right. uh, you know, uh, or is the home in many cases, what's happening is the home is just too big for the, uh, for the, the household. The household has changed, right? I mean, if you go back when you bought the home, you might have a child or two or three, you know, at some point you may have your parents living with you, but now your house is much, your household is much smaller. Do you really need, you know, 4,000 square feet or 3,000 square feet or even 2,500 square feet? I mean, do I, you know, it, it, is it even appropriate in the context of the fact that I'm aging and I've got different, you know, health considerations? So you have to think about all those things when, you know, making that decision. It's a complex decision. Uh, in a difficult one, because there's no certainty here. But, you know, those are the different different options that people have. There may be others uh, that I'm, you know, just not coming to mind, but that feels like the three uh, ways that people typically kind of tap the equity in their home. And, and for those younger generations, for those millennials who have just had a bear of a time getting a foothold into home ownership, as you look out ahead, do you believe that they'll get a chance? And and if they don't get the chance, how will they be able to accumulate the sort of asset base necessary for them to eventually retire? 
Yeah, great question. I, I think it's going to get better in terms of affordability, no doubt. I mean, the mortgage rate, the 30-year fix is at seven. It, it got as high as eight not too long ago. We're at seven. I suspect it's going to settle in around five and a half to six percent. And once that becomes clear to people, you know, right now I think there's a fair number of people out there thinking, oh, we're going back to pre-pandemic, you know, pandem pre-pandemic during the pandemic, you know, th two and a half, three, three and a half, maybe, but you know, I, I wouldn't plan on it. Uh, so, but it takes a while for people to come to the realization that we're not get going back there. And once that happens, then I think we're going to see more people put their homes up for sale. They're kind of holding off, waiting, hoping beyond hope that mortgage rates come down because they're kind of locked in. They got a three and a half percent mortgage. And if you, tr you know, if you buy and you sell and got to get another mortgage at seven, the economics don't work. But if you, if you realize we're not going back to three and a half, we're going to five and a half and six and your demographic situation is changing, you know, life events, the children, divorce, death, job yeah. change. You got to move, you get more inventory, and then we're going to get more supply. You know, builders at these prices, I mean, geez, you can make money. And so they can, they can build more and they will. They'll figure it out. We got these severe zoning restrictions and permitting issues. It's a real problem. But I'm, I'm thinking people are getting really fed up with that. And, you know, we're going to see some changes here uh, at the local level to make it easier for builders to build high density housing because that's what we need. Uh, and then we're going to get more creative with other types of housing, like manufactured housing. You know, one reason why the, that doesn't really work for people is because if you go get a loan, you can't get a mortgage loan. You get a so-called chattel loan, and that's a mess, you know, different terms and higher interest rates. It's a, and we just need uh, some uh, uh, like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac to step into that market and make it you know more rational. I, I can go on and on and on. But my point is that I do think there is a deep need and, uh, you know, uh, Americans are pretty good at solving problems. <laughs> it takes us a while and we, uh, we ultimately try all kinds of answers that ultimately don't work, but we ultimately do, you know, respond. And I think that'll be the case here. Now, is that going to solve people's problems for next year? No, uh, that's going to be, this is all, it took us since the financial crisis almost 15 years ago to get into this box. Right. It's going to take us, you know, could take us a generation to get out. Well, I, I'm going to hold on to your words that it is going to get better because that that just makes me feel better. A, as we as we wrap up here, we always like to just leave the viewers with a little bit of advice, a few tips for shoring up their own economic situation. As you are looking out at the markets, at interest rates, at the election, at the future. What do you what do you do in your own house and what do you tell people who ask, how do I make my own financial life better uh, in the short and the long term? Well, first, you got to save and you got to put it on autopilot. You know, don't say, OK, I'm gonna, you know, every pay period, I'm going to set aside the money. Just make sure that that money is pushed to whatever 401k. You got a matching. Obviously, you want to do that, but you want to put it on autopilot. Just take the money out before you even see it in your checking account, and just save. Uh, and second, really think about broadly, you know, what you're invested in and whether that makes sense in the context of how much risk you want to take and your age and all those other kinds of things and your other kind of cash needs. And then third, don't look. Don't look. You know, don't panic when you see red. Uh, don't get overly excited when you see green. Yeah, yeah, you might miss the Bitcoin craze, but you're going to miss the Bitcoin crash, you know, because, you know, you just it's just steady as you go. And, you know, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot in the first year. But once you start doing it, three, five, ten years, you start looking back, you go, oh, this, this is working. This makes a lot of sense. I feel really good. And it becomes self-reinforcing and you want to continue to add. The other thing is, you know, I think people don't spend enough time and I'm guilty of this, looking at their expenses. I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, stuff that we're paying for that we shouldn't be paying for, really, because, you know, it's his legacy. These, well, I'm not going to go there. I was going to tell you, well, I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> but I could, I could, I'm on the warpath, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I think I'd look at every single expense and I'd figure out, can I reduce that expense and not not try to solve that problem in one weekend? Every weekend. Take one expense and say, what can I do to reduce that expense or, you know, make it less costly to me? And that, that too, you know, it's one of those things that feels doesn't 
it's hard to do the first time you do it. It's like going outside and running. You, first time you run, you go, oh, this is this is awful. You keep at it every day. Two months later, you go, oh, this isn't so, you know, this it hurts, but I'm okay with this. You do this for six, eight months. You go, I love this. I, this yeah. is good. I'm good. I can do this. You want to do it. So that's, that's my advice. Well, I think it's it's great advice, and and as a as an avid runner, I I like the metaphor. So, thank you, um, Mark, for doing this. If people are looking for more information on you, on your work, on your election model, where do they go? They can Google Zandy. You'll, you'll I I think I'm there. I'm on Twitter <clears throat> at Mark Zandy. I, I I joined that late, uh, but I kind of enjoy it. It's kind of kind of interesting. Um, and I have a podcast, uh, which I really like inside economics every you got to be a little nerdy for that gene uh you got to kind of like right up my alley i you i think you'd like it uh yeah. we have a lot of fun we have good guests and um it's it's um the, the problem with it is it's always too long we can't shut up. it's always too long but you know people aren't really complaining if it's an hour hour 15 hour and a half i, I tell them you know listen to it saturday morning on, while you're running you know that, that's, that's probably really, there you go Exactly. Thank you so much for doing this. Always a pleasure to see you. Uh, for more information on this program, you can also go to our website. It is protectedincome.org. And for information on this show, protectedincome.org slash Zandi. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.